Hello, my name is Karen Church. I'm an attorney and president of LKE 1031 Services. This presentation on like-kind exchange basics is designed to give you just enough information to be dangerous. It's important to understand the basic elements I will be walking you through today are just the tip of the iceberg. The code and the Treasury regulations that flesh it out contain more detail and exceptions than we will be discussing here. My goal with this presentation is to give you enough basic information to understand what a like-kind exchange is and evaluate whether an exchange is something you would like to explore further. Before we jump into the technical elements of a like-kind exchange, I want to define some of the more commonly used terms. First, the exchange itself goes by many names, like-kind, tax-deferred, Section 1031, or Starker. They all refer to an exchange under Internal Revenue Code Section 1031. When people in the 1031 industry use the word exchanger, we are speaking of the taxpayer who's completing the exchange. So the term exchanger and taxpayer are interchangeable. When referring to the properties involved, and this is pretty intuitive, but let me discuss it anyways, the relinquished property is the property being sold by the taxpayer, and the replacement property is the property being acquired. Tax-deferred exchanges get their authority from Section 1031 of the Internal Revenue Code. That code section reads, No gain or loss shall be recognized on the exchange of property held primarily for use in a trade or business or for investment. If such property is exchanged solely for property of like kind, which is to be held either for productive use in a trade or business or for investment. There are three main elements of this provision. There needs to be an exchange, the properties must have a qualified use, and the properties must be like kind. Now let's discuss each of these elements separately. The first key element we'll discuss is the requirement that there be an exchange. An exchange is a reciprocal trade. I give something to you and you give something back to me. In other words, the same person who gets the relinquished property from the exchanger must be the one to give the exchanger the replacement property. It's easy to see how this might work in a two-party swap, but what happens when, say, Mr. Smith is the one who wants to buy your relinquished property, but Mr. Jones is the one who's selling your replacement? These three-way transactions, which by the way are the most common way exchanges are done, require an additional player to satisfy this element of an exchange. That player is called the Qualified Intermediary, sometimes known as the QI for short. The QI is the exchange agent, and although I won't go into the technical details of the QI's role in this presentation, they are the ones that make three-party transactions comply with that technical element of an exchange. An exchange is not a sale followed by a purchase. This can be very confusing, because when you look at an exchange from the outside, it will look very much that way. The next key element to understand is the code's requirement that both the property being sold and the property being purchased are and will be used for certain allowed purposes. To qualify for exchange treatment, the properties involved need to be either productively used in a trade or business or held for investment. An example of a property used in a trade or business would be a warehouse owned by a bicycle manufacturer or even the bicycle factory itself. Examples of property held for investment would be an apartment complex, office building, or rental home. You will notice what is not considered as qualified would be properties held for personal use. Your primary residence or a vacation home are two examples. Those properties cannot be either the relinquished or replacement property in an exchange. It's important to recognize that uses of property can change over time. An exchanger may have exchanged into a single-family residence and then intending to use it as a rental home, but then several years later decides to convert it to their primary residence. What matters, at least as far as qualified use is concerned, is what was the exchanger's intent for the property at the time of the exchange. It probably shouldn't come as a surprise that one of the key elements of a like-kind exchange is that the properties involved must be of a like-kind. But what exactly does that mean? Actually, let me rephrase that, because I could give an hour-long presentation just on the like-kind exchange element alone. So instead of telling you exactly what that means, let me give it to you in general terms. 
For the most part, dirt is like kind to dirt, meaning real property is going to be like kind to any other real property. The slide gives the example of an exchange with the relinquished property being an apartment complex in Studio City, California, and the replacement being an office building in Omaha. The fact that the properties have different uses is irrelevant. For federal purposes, the fact that the relinquished property is in California and the replacement in Nebraska is also irrelevant. Although I should point out that for state tax purposes, things aren't always that clear. Now, if that office building was in Vancouver, British Columbia, that would be a problem because foreign real estate is not like kind to U.S. This dirt is dirt rule works for most real estate interests, but when you get into some of the more unique situations, like conservation easements and water rights, things can get a little bit tricky. But as the slide points out, a leasehold interest with a remaining term greater than 30 years will be seen as like kind to a fee interest in real estate. I'm not going to spend much time on personal property, but suffice it to say, the like-kind rules are not so simple. Personal property must be like-kind, meaning the same type of property, or the same general asset class to qualify under 1031. So an airplane for an airplane is okay, but an airplane for a backhoe is not. As mentioned at the beginning, the problem with brief introductions to any topic is often it gives the listener just enough information to be dangerous. Understanding the rules of 1031 don't help unless you also know when Section 1031 won't apply. On this slide, I've listed the exceptions from 1031 treatment. You cannot complete an exchange on the disposition of any of these types of assets. Let me highlight three of them. Stock in trade or business is inventory. A home builder cannot use a 1031 exchange to defer the gain on the sale of a house he built because that house is held primarily for resale as part of his inventory. In our recovery economy, we see a lot of investors flipping houses. These houses are acquired and improved to sell, so those houses do not qualify for an exchange. Now, if the investor were to tweak his business model and buy the distressed houses to improve and rent them, instead of selling them right away. That would be a 1031 opportunity because the house would no longer be seen as stock in trade. The next important exception is interest in a partnership. Let me make sure you understand this exception does not prevent partnerships themselves from completing an exchange. Partnerships can and do complete exchanges all the time. This exception relates to an interest in a partnership. So if partners A, B, and C are not getting along and B wants out, this exception would prevent B from using a like-kind exchange to defer the gain on the transfer of his partnership interest. This exclusion also prevents an exchanger from buying a partnership interest as a replacement property. Finally, while not technically an exclusion in the code, you cannot use a 1031 exchange to defer the gain associated with the sale of goodwill. Goodwill of one business is never going to be considered like kind to the goodwill of another, so there cannot be an exchange. There are two critical timing requirements under Section 1031. Both start running on the day the exchanger transfers the relinquished property. Within 45 days of that sale, the exchanger must identify the potential replacement properties. There are extensive rules on how to make a proper identification, but they are beyond the scope of this presentation. The second deadline is the 180-day exchange period. What that means is within 180 days from the day the exchanger transferred the relinquished property, he must acquire one or more of those identified replacement properties. A couple important things to know about these deadlines. First, the 45 and 180 days are calendar days, not business days. So if the 45th or 180th day happen to fall on a weekend or holiday, the task must be completed before that weekend or holiday. Second, when I first started in the 1031 industry in the late 1990s, I was able to say there were never extensions to these deadlines. That changed as part of Congress's response to the 9-11 tragedy. Now, there is one scenario, and one scenario only, in which these deadlines can be extended, and that is in the face of a presidentially declared disaster. 
sometimes referred to as the napkin rule because it's so simple you can write it on the back of a cocktail napkin, there are three basic requirements for a fully tax deferred exchange. You'll better appreciate these rules if you understand the public policy behind Congress allowing 1031 exchanges is to encourage a continuation of investment. With this in mind, the first rule is the replacement property must have a value that is greater or equal to the value of the relinquished property. So if you sell for $10, you'll need to buy for $10, or $11, or $20. If you buy for $9, you won't have a full deferral. When an exchange involves multiple relinquished or replacement properties, you'll use the aggregate values. Second, an exchanger must reinvest all net proceeds of the relinquished property sale into the replacement property. Again, keep in mind the policy behind 1031 is to continue investment, so any cashing out of an investment is going to be taxable. Finally, when there is debt on the relinquished property, the replacement property must have debt in the same amount. If the exchanger does not want to get debt on the replacement property, or if they prefer a lower amount, they will need to invest new cash into the purchase to offset the debt that's not being replaced. It's important to know that partial exchanges are possible. So an exchanger can exchange down in value or take some cash out of a deal. But in doing so, tax will be recognized. If you're doing a partial exchange, you always want to run your numbers by your CPA because you could end up recognizing all of your gain, making the exchange worthless. So although we've covered a lot of material in this presentation, as I mentioned, there is so much more that we haven't touched. This presentation will hopefully provide you with enough information to determine if your transaction would qualify for 1031 treatment. If so, I would invite you to review my website and contact my office to learn more about a like-kind exchange planning consultation. In a planning consultation, we will have an in-depth conversation about the properties, your ownership, and your goals. I will discuss any issues that may cause a problem for a successful exchange. Most importantly, I will follow everything up with a written plan of action. It will contain the information on the parties and properties involved and will walk you step by step through the exchange transaction. This written plan can be used to make sure that all parties are on the same page as you navigate through your exchange. So hopefully you found this short presentation useful. If you are interested in learning if your transaction could benefit from a like-kind exchange, please call my office for a free evaluation. I look forward to hearing from you.